All right, so I think what we're going to do next, if you guys don't have any questions, was talk a little bit about um, uh, network virtualization. So is this leading into the portions in regards to VMware and their announcements? Or? That's actually what we are going to talk so, about right now. So, so the dovetail on top of that, I mean, Colin, Colin posted a quick question just to so okay. get it out there so that he doesn't bug me too much. <laughs> but he had spoken to you previously about ingesting um, data from other other resources, specifically uh, Solometer for for the OpenStack side and then CloudWatch on the Amazon side. Are you guys doing anything there? If you're talking about VMware, and you're talking about ingesting new sources of data input for your system. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. I think that's why it's important to follow what Danny kind of put the context about how we do, how we go about adding features to our product right now, is that we tend to do things when the pain level for our customers is high enough to actually get there. And so one of the problems that we have with the CloudWatch or other things like that or other online services is that typically for our customer base to actually request those uh, type of features, it, it really is late in the game. And so, so, But are you just talking to the wrong audience in the room? That's my second question about that because the app guys are the ones that are pushing to AWS. Are you actually having a conversation yeah. with them? Yeah, so in versus fact, I, I, uh, we just ran uh, a survey into our base, which is a mix of kind of generalist, network guys, server guys, and ask them about what their companies are doing with public cloud like Amazon. Uh, and you know, it's not a lot, it's not nothing, right? It's more than it was two years ago when we asked. Uh, but it's probably maybe 20, 25% are using any public cloud. And when they're using it, a lot of it is for uh, dev test, right? They're, used, they're not doing it in production. When they are doing it in production, it tends to be web hosting. Yeah, so I think it. if you ask the question to a different audience in that group in that same company, you will get a different answer. Yes, if you, and we, yeah. we do know, if you talk to developers especially, there's a lot of, of usage going on. So that's so we've done the survey first into our base, and the next thing we're going to do is start taking that exact same survey, and then, but if you're not talking to your own base, now you've got to go uh, hire people to help you go find customers uh, to talk to that are not your own customers. So uh, look, we agree, there's a lot of stuff going on uh, in cloud, but if you're looking at our existing products, where is the demand? It's not, it's not there yet. Okay, so my argument is that the demand is not coming from the right group. Or the existing users of SolarWinds aren't. They aren't the ones that are deploying yeah. AWS. Or uh, for sure, so it, I think it's important to kind of look at the, the two aspects of the customers. You know, you've got existing customers, those are paying the bills right now. They are, main, you know, hmm. they are renewing maintenance and things like that. So we have to make sure that we take care of that aspect. Then there's the whole other set, which is really about growth. And that, you know, maybe that we don't necessarily talk or we, you know, or we know that there's demand there, but that demand is not high enough for us right now to kind of do some of those things. That's really kind of the reality of things. Look, I'm a technologist. I like to do things early on. I'd like to jump right now on you know, VS, um, uh, NSX from VMware, for instance. I tried to get the bits earlier this week from them. No, we can't get them to them. You know, I like to do that type of stuff. But then I have to put my, my business hat and look at how within SolarWinds does this fit? And often, we have to wait a little bit. And honestly, also, when I look at CloudWatch, <clears throat> okay, we could consume CloudWatch data, and then what? We are just providing another dashboard, basically, of the exact same data that they get through the, the AWS console. So what is the value add? No, the value add is, yeah, if we can start stitching that information to the application that we know we are monitoring within those instances, then I think that becomes more interesting. But again, that, that requires more planning. And, and actually, before we actually go onto that type of development, typically, that's where we need to make sure that the noise level about those type of requests is high enough for us to justify and, that. And we are working on, on our server uh, monitoring stuff, we are working on adding agents specifically for the cloud, cloud-based instances. So that, because uh, again, when we've talked to people, what they say they would prefer, and, and it's kind of the same thing with CloudWatch, you don't want to, all your cloud stuff over here managed with a different tool, and then your <laughs> physical stuff managed over here. You want them together. So we are going to start pulling the cloud data in, uh, and so I would expect so one that of, to one come of the out in 2014. One of the challenges, though, is that a lot of people don't want to put agents within their cloud environment, right? And so that's the whole purpose for these devices to be doing them. Mm -hmm. the, that data collection for you. And so having the interface to be able to ingest those, then you can do event correlations, you can do all the other sorts of things that you want to be able to do in a single mm -hmm. tool set. 
No, but so. Ed, if they would go down that route, if I would be them, I would just go straight to the uh, Amazon API. Right. I wouldn't go through an intermediate. Right, like but right now they're saying launch. putting an agent on there, that's SNMP poly ingestion or whatever else they're doing today. Well, I think so. that it, it all depends the level of visibility that you yeah. want in the stack, you know, because it's all about that. If, if you're happy with what Amazon can give you through their API, well, so be it, you know, we could consume that data. Unfortunately, when you want to monitor an app in the cloud, if you look at the new Relic and app dynamics of the world, which are giving you kind of transaction level and actually, you know, not black box visibility into your app, but really kind of component level into your app, then there's an agent somewhere. Whether it's, you know, you're deploying it yourself as part of your, um, you know, kind of Amazon image, or you're using a PaaS environment where like Azure, where you can basically just check the box and say, hey, use New Relic and basically give me this. There's an agent that basically give you that data. So I agree with you, you know, I think that, you know, we, at one point we're going to have that, you know, and, and, and there's, there's, a de uh, there's a demand there. Again, I have to put that in perspective with the rest of the, the requests that we get. And, at the end of the day, how much money is that going to make us if we do this now versus other features? That's usually what it comes down to. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, so let me just sometimes it kind of comes across. So, uh, for example, an API. I, mean, I remember years ago, for years and years, asking for an API. How do I extract data, my data, out of your platform? Yep. Right, and that yep. just took way too long. Uh, so just you know kind of starts to appear as if, you know, you're getting a little too comfortable as uh, kind of the leader in that space. But I also, I totally appreciate, like, the candor on it. I mean, I think this conversation's great. And, well, look, what I would say, because uh, I'm sure at some point, if you were asking that on Thwack, you're probably asking it of me at some point back, uh, back in the day. Uh, the API took a long time. Part of it is what we inherited from the, you know, the, the sort of original family-run business was very profitable, but somewhat, you know, crazy set of code. It was all <laughs> written in Visual Basic 6. Like, we used to have to, like, have this heart-to-heart -heart with the new developers. Look, you're going to get to write some cool stuff, but you're going to have to work with VB6. And they, you know, they'd sort of knuckle up and just, oh, we'll do it. But so there was a lot of stuff that was very messy, and you just, it was a black box. It was single thread. There's a lot of things you couldn't do. Uh, so... We also do have a philosophy because we have a large customer base that we try not to just tear something down and rebuild it from scratch. Uh, there's a couple of times we violated that principle and it did not go well. Uh, so we like to just build stuff incrementally. So yes, it does take longer. Um, we've also been building other products. Uh, so I would say where we're at now versus where we're at four or five years ago, we were small. I mean, we were really small. Uh, now we have, I think, a, a very sizable engineering team. The, the number of people just working on NPM now is greater than the number, is actually a multiple of the number of people in the company, you know, four or five years ago, before we had that API. So things are moving much, much faster. We're able to tackle much bigger, uh, much bigger problems than we did. So, and, and, and to go back to the, the API, so I mean, I, I wrote the original API, so the one that took so long to actually come out, you know, and it's not because <laughs> yeah, I code slowly, but... That's what um, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that what, what happened is, um, you know, actually the API was there, you know, I think we probably wrote, so I joined in 2007, um, I think we probably put the API in place around 2008, but it took a, lot, a long time to actually publicize it and make it available to the public also, because it took a long time for us to stabilize it just because of, you know, what Denny said, that the, the foundation under it was very kind of, you know, fragile. Um, you know, it was actually very humbling to actually join SoloWinds coming from kind of a traditional enterprise software company where you just realize that you don't need to have the perfect engineered product to actually make, you know, to be very, a very profitable and very growing, you know, fast growing business. Uh, but that had its kind of onset of, you know, just, drawbacks is the fact that you had this huge code base that you actually had to kind of put in shape so that you could actually build on top of it. And so, you know, we put that kind of API in place. But the thing that I'm, I'm pretty happy with is that, look, it's 2013. And honestly, the API really has not changed since 2008. Since actually when we actually put the first version, we've actually changed the endpoints. But the basic philosophy of the API hasn't changed at all. And so 
Sure, we, we add entities and we add you know, different objects that you can manage through the entities, you know, through the API over time. And, and that kind of took a little bit of time. Uh, the thing that took the longest time is probably to add ways to make change to the API, like you know, be able to manage unmanaged nodes and kind of you know, having methods and, and, and having kind of verbs and taking actions on the product. That is still where, not where I want it to be. You know, I've, you know, I've talked for a long time of us you know, being able to accelerate that, but again, that's all you know, typically customer driven. And unless we have a lot of requests for that type of operation to be able to be done through the API, typically we, we, you know, it's going to take a while before we actually get there if, it, if, the, if the noise is not high enough. So if, are you guys looking at any of the, so you mentioned NSX, I would say uh, Daylight is another one that you should be watching, I mean, this idea of I mean, the problem with trying to either develop on network elements today or capture data from them is it's, everything's strewn everywhere, everything's disaggregated. So these central points to collect information. I mean, analytics is the future of computing and obviously the future of networking also. Right. So, uh, yeah, maybe. so we are, you know, so just to go back, I think it's a good segue to, to NSX. Um, I think that, you know, I was at VMworld and, you know, kind of attended a lot of the sessions and played with it in the, the hands-on lab. And I think, it's, it, I think it's a pretty cool technology. You know, I think that it, it kind of brings, um, a, a, you know, a new set of challenges for people because no, you know, you add one more layer of indirection and that's where the magic happens. But typically also that's where, you know, the complication happens because you have mapping between two layers. So I think that uh, we're going to, and it, it provides a lot of opportunity for us for, as a management and kind of monitoring company to actually, you know, solve and help people kind of get their job done faster in terms of diagnosing issues. Um, it looks like they have some built-in products, you know, within the kind of, uh, from the Nisira, uh, you know, acquisition in terms of diagnosing kind of, you know, overlay network to physical network issues. Um, you know, honestly, I don't think that those tools can be used, you know, on a very scalable manner. Uh, I mean, it looks like they do the job, but again, how do you integrate that within your existing tool chain? That's the question. You know, it's all those vendors have kind of their one-offs, but I think that the, the interesting thing for me is that, you know, I think it has a higher chance of being adopted faster than OpenFlow, for instance, in the, in the type of customers that we are seeing, because it's going to be built in into the hypervisor. And that's what making the difference between, you know, when we talked about SDN, we talked about SDN maybe 18 months ago when, you know, OpenFlow was, you know, touted and, and there was a lot of, of, of hype around it. And, and in the end, for us, you know, our customers are not big service providers. They don't have a lot of multi-tenancy. They don't have a lot of need for traffic segregation within their data centers and things like that. It's not the primary market for where OpenFlow, right now at least the, the main use cases for OpenFlow were actually you know, brought in. But when you look at NSX, well, that's built in into the hypervisor. So even if people are not needing this technology right now, suddenly the enabler for that technology will actually be spread out and spread across, you know, thousands of different, you know, uh, installation all over the market. And I can guarantee you that there's going to be a big overlap with our customers, because one thing that we know is that a lot of our customers are running Orion and any of the products into VMs. And most of them are in VMware. They are not in Hyper-V. So again, we, we know that from, from that aspect, there's a higher likelihood of that technology actually, uh, you know, getting adopted faster. What that means for us is that, Yes, this is something that actually is probably something that we need to watch much more closely. And whenever I can get my hands on the NSX bit, then you know, I'd like to see actually exactly how that thing can be managed and monitored. And also, how can we help basically the IT admins and the network admins in particular, you know, help them kind of do their job better into that environment. Yeah, I mean, management's are going to be centralized, regardless of anybody's religion on control. Mm -hmm. Management's going to be centralized, and you're going to either be part of the ecosystem or you're not, right? Right. That's, that's going to be a direct threat with you guys because it's going to be significantly easier for with horizontalization for people to come in develop there. Yeah, but the question I have is when you all network admins here, you know, are, re are you ready to kind of relinquish all the control that you have right now in virtualization? Talking to the network people. The what? Uh, Talking to systems. That's the wrong question. <laughs> okay. I don't What's the right question? Uh, right because question. you are slicing the responsibilities mm -hmm. at the network, physical network to physical server boundary. That will happen in some organizations, and I wish them luck. Uh, where people are smart, uh, the networking team will just inherit that other part of the virtual networking as well. So networking people will have to learn new skills. I mean, of course, the server or virtualization people will try to do it on their own first. That's, but and they'll yeah, fail that's hard. Expect. 
But, but that's and the, then we'll talk. And I think that that's the exact point there is that, right? No, if you look at VMware, they've tended to actually, you know, kind of shifted and pivoted oh, the, the whole admin side is for the virtual marketing admin. because they are selling to server people. Yeah. Yes. And this is how you get rid of those pesky networking people. Well, I mean, because hmm? yeah. they've had the same thing where the server guys have become for a while uh, kind of accidental storage admins. And they don't, you know, that was great for a while, and then you talk to them, and they don't generally like it. Exactly. Because it's a, it's a whole domain of expertise they don't particularly want to go and, and get. But, but yeah, well, like the, like so there are two responses I get back on, on this front. The first one is, uh, yeah, of course, the networking people will eventually start doing that. The other response is, well, you know, if you only have one application stack to manage, if it's not hundred application stacks all converging on the same physical firewall and load balancer, it's not that complex. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, the application team can actually configure those three firewall rules because it's only three of them. Yeah, I think they can, but you know, one thing that kind of was interesting when I played with it at the, the hands-on lab, for instance, mm -hmm. is that if you're not, if you don't have n at least knowledge about networking, configuring routing rules and things like that, and OSPF, the alphabet soup is still there. You know, oh, it might whole be that, 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 that's another problem, yeah, because they they're doing exactly the same thing as Cisco is doing, which is giving you a flashy <coughs> GUI in front of CLI. Uh huh. Yes. If you don't know what you're doing, you're totally stuck. Yep. It just makes it easier for you to make a mistake. Right, because uh, well, it, make, it, it makes you spend more time because instead of typing in what you need to do, you have to find your way around clicking it. But yeah, yeah. you're gonna go to Wikipedia <laughs> and figure out what the SPF is if you've never heard about it, you know, and, yeah. and then try to kind of make some sense out of that thing. But you know, I think that's where, honestly, that's where I think the friction is gonna come is is because of that transition. That's what may slow down the adoption of it. <coughs> it's gonna be right there. People will want to play with it, mm -hmm. but then. You know the reality of who's managing it and, 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 and who takes the decision about you know doing all that segregation of traffic in over there. I don't think that people are ready to actually make that. No, but let's be honest. We are probably the only two people who would try to configure OSPF and those things as the first thing they would do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I did exactly the same thing. <laughs> well, I also did BGP. Yes. Uh, <laughs> for, for a regular application stack deployment where you don't need mobility between data centers, yep. uh, you have one outside address and internal addresses are hidden because it's a load balancer or a firewall with NAT. So there is nothing to configure. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it is manageable by someone who knows a little bit about networking. So, you, you know, you're saying earlier that management for sure is going to be centralized. Do you mean the management of the whole VMware stack or just management in general? Because it's, it's in some places right now we see that it is actually generalized or, or centralized, that you've got kind of a monitoring team or a management team, but just as often and maybe more often, it's fragmented, right? Yeah, if, I mean, yeah but it, wireless controllers, you know, uh, your telephony platform, uh, your, your VoIP telephony platforms, I mean, that's what the network, I mean, that's what, in my opinion, it's not going to be a damn CLI that people are sitting around. Per, bo per box. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, it's yeah, I think you have view center for servers, PBX yeah. for voice, you have controllers for wireless for network. There'll be a controller or something like it to centrally manage, inherently built into the vendor's platform. Right. So, what about the fact that you're going to have this mix of, you know, virtualized networking and sort of classic, uh, what we'll eventually call legacy physical networking? Unified man now, this up. is where I see your, you guys. Yeah, that's your job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there would be this dream product that could actually give me a unified view of both. Mm -hmm. Because right now, you know, there are some people who say, yeah, we want to control everything. I, I won't name them. You know who they are. And there are these other people who say, well, you know, we are just overlays and you put any IP below us and we'll magically do our stuff. Mm -hmm. We know they're both wrong. Mm -hmm. So if you could provide something that could actually look at both ends and do some correlation, 
It's like, yeah, I see low performance on this VM. And guess what? This VM is on server X, and server X has linked to these switches. And yeah, I see high CPU utilization on that switch. So mm, maybe you should look at that. Yep. I had a question regarding you. You speak about very conservative adoption, and you, you don't want to annoy your customer base. Yet I see as we move to software networking and all the rest of it, the ability to continuously implement and integrate is going to speed up. For us to radically change the way we monitor or show you how we look at uh, objects and network and the things that you might tap into, do you find that your conservative approach may not be the best moving forward? Do you find that, that it could actually bite you on the bum? So, uh, and I think that that's why we wanted to talk, for instance, with you guys about, you know, SDN, NSX, those type of trends here. You know, we are kind of at least getting more feedback from a group of, you know, people who are dedicated for networking. So that's kind of the context. I think that the answer is maybe. Because conservative uh, I, I good. think that I wrong. agree with your statement that, yes, I think the rate of innovation, know that you move in software, will be faster right. than when you had to so, actually yeah. make an ASIC out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that the, there's, a, there's a high risk for us that if we are not you know, kind of catching us earlier on some of those trends, we may actually be late. Mm -hmm. No, if history is any you know, uh, measure, it's never been hurting us in the past, but again, you know, you can't never let rest on your laurels on that. You have to kind of look proactively on those markets. And that's where, you know, why we want to have this discussion right now about NSX, you know, and those overlay network and kind of SDN in general, and I guess SDDC for the, you know, the overall umbrella is that, you know, because it, it looks like that's definitely something that is taking place. I think that NSX, as I said, has a high likelihood of being adopted faster, especially for simple things where there, there doesn't need to be this kind of additional or advanced network configuration. And so, yes, that's why for me, I want, to, I want to play with it. You know, I want to see how, you know, from a technology perspective, how, what does that mean to integrate that into our offering? I like your product, but the thing is, if it's not going to do the job, if I move to software, cloud instances, Amazon, whatever, and it can't do it, I'm going to keep moving forward with what I can use. Sure. And that's going to leave, I'll leave the investment behind because it uh, can't do uh, it. But so if you have a conservative life cycle and I'm, I'm getting away from you and you're not catching up, I find that an issue. No, Anthony, the, what, what you have to realize is that th their target market mm. is not moving to the cloud. Potentially. They are deploying things like Dropbox and Google Dots and all that stuff. Sure. <laughs> and you guys should really look at Thousand Eyes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Joel literally sent me an email uh, about that. <laughs> We've, we've got our eye on them. Yeah. So, but, but, uh, <laughs> good. <laughs> That's one part yeah, of the story. I, I don't see SMB customers moving to Amazon anytime soon. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah I just see the, 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 the gap, uh, painting the conservative picture, which for my enterprise, conservative is good. But I can see for a lot of people who need to be agile, the, the gap between your development cycle and the industry, maybe like the, that development cycle and software, just the gap growing maybe too big for you to catch back up. Well, that's too and I'd hate to see that gap get too big for you because I'd like what you do. Yeah. So that's just my thoughts. And, yeah. and right now, a lot of platforms manage everything, campus, LAN, WAN. And I think you can decouple that, right? And innovate in the data center and cloud and be agile and keep, you know, current slower platform for just campus, legacy, you know, IDF, MDF type networking, right? There's no reason to have to combine, you know, both platforms to manage in a larger environment, if you will. Well, I just think, so my concern with networking yeah. professionals is, particularly enterprise, is if they don't start transitioning uh, to a softer world, then they're gonna become irrelevant. Because we're already seeing that now, with now the sysadmin's gonna nail up overlays. Like if the network can't execute, they don't need them. They're just gonna do it anyway. Do you, do you guys and, think? But uh, then the next would be, is the because if systems people, we already see this. If systems people can't execute, <laughs> the workload winds up in Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that same thing's gonna happen in that world. So. Well, I mean, what we definitely see is people are, they're not, there's not much interest at all in taking your old application and just moving it to the cloud but new applications, yeah, yeah. Uh, rather than have a big, let's go buy a bunch of expensive servers and storage and whatnot, okay, we'll build that over here. And developers especially are pushing it, right? Because IT guys have to keep stuff running. They are, I think, naturally conservative. You don't want to be, you don't want stuff breaking. Developers, you know, DevOps movement aside, are less cautious. 
and they're more likely to go, I want something new and interesting and the latest, and they'll just go try whatever, right? That's just sort of uh, the nature. DevOps, that whole movement is trying to sort of bring the, the developers into the operations piece, uh, but that's still just, it's not that big yet from what we can see. Sorry, I was going to say, you know, the, the cloud cloud integration is definitely moving down market, though. You mm -hmm. know, I have some smaller customers that that a few years ago would not have been thinking about, you know, using Amazon at all, for instance, right? And they're starting to get there now. And maybe it's not for everything production, um, you know, but it is, like you said before, you have some dev and test environments, DR capabilities, mm -hmm. and some, you know, and some light load production stuff. Um, so it is coming, and I think, you know, public cloud is an area where I think, um, Greg, I think you said this a couple years ago on a podcast, you know, so huge companies are going to build private clouds, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Small companies are going to use public cloud because it's uh, cheap. Bob, it depends on what you define as small. Three VMs, I agree with you. Something that could justify two servers internally, public cloud is too expensive. Yeah, I think that just from internally, um, what, what I see is, um, you know, from, from our own usage, we use cloud typically and public cloud for like, new stuff, when we don't know what the capacity exactly is going to be, what the load's going to be, I think cloud is perfect at that point as a test bed. You know, yeah. you put it there, it's cheap, you bring it on, bring it off, you know, kind of reassign the resource. And then what happens is if you believe that, you know, that's something that actually you need to keep running for after a few months, most of the time we move that back in. Because from a that cost works. perspective from us, it basically, from a CapEx, we actually prefer CapEx than OpEx in that case. Because that cost is sunk, and that server is going to run for three years, and it doesn't require a lot of maintenance. You know? Yeah, in fact, we've, you know, Joel and I do a lot of the M&A for, um, pretty much all the M&A for SolarWinds. And so we talk, you know, you buy one company, but you talk to 20. And so we talk a lot to folks who are doing, offering their stuff hosted or on-prem. And one of the common themes you get is, well, when the customer is really small, they want it hosted. But when it gets to a certain point, then they start to, to care about CapEx, it flips, and they suddenly find, no, that hosting stuff is expensive, and it's expensive in a way I don't like. I would much prefer to go buy the servers, install it myself. So, I mean, is that? If IT can execute, though, right? I mean, that's, that's part of the problem. So yeah, for sure, aren't yes. Gonna, they aren't going to lose their jobs over, over capital. They're going to put it there. Uh, yes. I mean, and 33% of the internet's Netflix. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the other thing, you mentioned DevOps before. Something like NSX actually allows you to do that internally. <coughs> yes. Yeah. So if the ops guys are smart enough to just let go and allow the developers to create what they need and they own it, that's the, that's the important part. Don't let them create what they need and they just dump it on you. They have to own it. Then you can get the same agility as with the cloud right? for lower price. Yes. Yeah, that is the trick, though, to yeah. get them not to, like, oh, this is boring maintenance stuff now. Oh, no, 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 no. there's no escape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we're, we're exactly going through that right now. I own the, the, the web dev team, basically, who, who maintains all our web properties. And, and one of the things is, you know, IT right now, or IT team owns the ops part of it, which mm -hmm. is, you know, kind of bringing, once we have delivered the bids, they put them on the servers. And... I really want to bring those two things together. You know, I want DevOps, really. And honestly, NSX would actually be really nice because then you put a little bit of chef into that, you know, kind of automate the whole damn thing. You know, you can bring new servers in. <laughs> and I can tell you, it's a very unpleasant conversation right now with the IT ops team they because like they, don't, they, feel, they don't feel comfortable at all with you know, giving up control of that. And they have good reason, they have valid reason of why they don't want that. But for me, the only way forward is to actually bring those two things together. IT and ops and dev need to actually kind of be really hand in hand and actually, you know, the developers need to take ownership of the operations part because that's the only way they're going to actually write, you know, kind of so, code that is not buggy. So if, with you saying that, are you actually looking to change your tooling to have different integration points? Because one of the things that's happened, like I'm Microsoft out of Visual Studio, mm -hmm. there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to instantiate and deliver all these services directly out of a Visual Studio build. When you click to deploy for your app, right, you can do that in Azure today. Yes. Right, you can push directly. What, how does that look abstraction-wise any different from what you're proposing? And suddenly SolarWinds looks very different because now you need hooks directly into what the development teams are doing in order to do that, right? So, yeah, and, and what I'm telling you here is my team internally, basically, that maintains that. Sure, 
you know, could that have an impact eventually on our product portfolio and having some, uh, you know, some impact on, on, on product decision in the future? Yes, I think we've made it clear before, you know, with our investors, a public company, we have always kind of make sure that it's public. We've said that we would look at other markets at one point, and I think we've talked about, you know, some of the adjacent market that we were looking at, and, and one of them was potentially the dev tools. De so, yeah, uh, DevOps you know, is very interesting to us mm -hmm. because that is, they're coming together, and we kind of worry that if we don't have a foot with the developers that um, you could be you could be kind of cut out of the process mm -hmm. if the developers sort of end up in more control of more more monitoring. Well, and, I mean, you've, you've got this advantage because you're sitting on a noxious amount of data. You've got all the analytics of the network. So if you aren't taking advantage of that beyond reporting, you know, I think well, that, that's I mean, really kind of why, where we want to go, kind of go short term, you know, kind of when, when Danny talked about the platform and, and we are integrating right now. Um, it's kind of interesting because I think I did a talk here, uh, you know, probably four years ago when we were announcing SAM 1.0 or something like that. And, and I talked about the fact that, you know, at the time we, would, we, we, want, we didn't want to build the Uber console or the Uber, you know, kind of single pane of glass. But I think, have, you know, time has kind of evolved. And, and what we've heard is that from a monitoring perspective, you know, for all the monitoring that we do, People expect, our customers are expecting all that into one single GUI. Um, you know, they don't want to have to redefine, you know, alerts into another, you know, kind of GUI. And, then, and, and with all the products that we have acquired, you know, it kind of makes it very difficult. Because at the time, what we were looking at is we were looking at federation to actually, uh, you know, kind of federate the data. So not replicating all the data between those different products, but actually more federating it. So going to the product <coughs> itself to answer the, 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 the different questions that, you know, somebody would ask. Um, but in the end, for us, it doesn't fit what our customers are expecting. It doesn't fit also from a kind of user experience because, no, if I want to download something, I have to download a product here. I have to download another virtual appliance. I have to connect all of them. It's kind of very kind of a Frankenstein, actually, you know, uh, or Frankenware type of, of, of deal. And so for us solo wins, it just doesn't work. So what we're doing is, you know, kind of leveraging the API. The beauty of it is that some of those products already were integrated behind the scenes, you know, and data was flowing between them. And now what we have to do is kind of rejigger the UI to actually work out of a local storage instead of kind of you know working out of a federated storage. But the, the, the nice thing that we've done is that by kind of moving to that API even internally for us, uh, you know, we have decoupled the fact that the data is available locally from the data is available remotely. It's not an issue really for the GUI. It's just that you know uh, it's more a decision for us of optimizing where the data is stored versus how the data is accessed. So we're going to move you know more into that and 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 what the API gives us also is this kind of interconnection between data entities or objects or whatever you call them. So we know that, uh, you know, for instance, a network device has interfaces. There's a, a strong relationship between those two entities. There's actually a, uh, an aggregation, you know, entity so that an interface can't exist by itself. It needs to be attached to a node. Um, in in pre-APIs days, well, you had a database table. And there was no relationship, there was no referential integrity between those tables. So you could actually end up with, you know, interface entries into that database table that actually had nothing to do with a network device. And, and there was nothing that was actually gui guiding you, you know, out of that. No, with what we have, I don't know if you, you guys are familiar with Network Atlas, I guess, you know, and the, the tools to kind of, you know, generate the maps. That tool is completely data driven out of the API. So all the relationship that you see, the hierarchical you know, tree that is built on the left, is all built out of the metadata that is coming from the API. So basically, that tool goes at runtime and figure out what are the managed objects that you have in your repository, and what are the ones that are connected to those managed objects. And so let me basically kind of enumerate all that. And then basically, from the user basically can just drag and drop you know, those on the maps. But at the end of the day, the tool is not hard coded for one particular product. You can add SAM, or you add IPAM, or you add VNQM, for instance, to the mix, and suddenly no network atlas becomes just much more richer, because there's a lot more you know, objects uh, that are basically tied to each other and that you can drop there. Yeah, so that ties perfectly into what I was trying to say. Uh, so you know that the network people are now going through different stages of grief <laughs> <laughs> regarding NSX. And so if you go deeper <laughs> and collect the NSX related objects and data as well, that would allow us to build the map that goes beyond physical into the virtual. Yes. And on the other hand, with all these DevOps movements, like always, there will be a lot of finger pointing. 
So it would be cool to have the superhero product that could go and say, OK, this is end-to-end -end path. Yes. And these things are hitting these physical points, and they're hitting those <coughs> virtual points. And between those virtual points, they're yet again hitting these physical points. Yes. And so you have the whole end-to-end -end troubleshooting path. Yeah, that is really what we're, we're working on. We are good. We're, we've, one of the projects we've kicked off like uh, recently, right at, that's kicking off right after this release this week, is it doesn't have a good name internally. Uh, sometimes it's called Global Search. I can't remember what the other thing they, they're calling it. Uh, but the idea is that as you integrate and ev all the data is now uh, much easier to sort of aggregate, is you, you want something that was uh, kind of like Splunk in its early days when it was really, today Splunk is really a platform, you build apps on top of it. But Splunk four or five years ago, a lot of what it was is it pulled a lot of logs in, and then in a time for span, it would just tell you everything. We think that we've got so much data now that we could, we could deliver some of that as well, but we could also deliver it graphically. What the goal would be, if you've got a, a broad array of our products, and you say, well, I had a problem in this time frame, tell me kind of everything that happened for all the sources, and then try and, and, and come up with some sort of root cause. Mm -hmm. We're very reluctant to promise root cause analysis because basically everyone promises it all the time. And no one delivers? No one really delivers it. We've talked to a few companies who uh, tell us that they have uh, found this holy grail. And we're like, that is awesome. We are so excited. We would like to buy you if you can show us that this is real. And then Joel gives them a the big database of data and then they disappear and they never come back to have the follow-up conversation where they were able to do it with our data. And we're like, our data is really pretty simple. Uh, so yeah, it's hard. So, but we think just because you can't get all the way there, we want to start making significant progress toward that, toward that, uh, that root cause analysis uh, dream. And so we're, we're actively working on that now. And then NSX would really just be one more source into that, into that picture. Yeah. Just like, I think from a configuration management perspective, that's kind of all the monitoring and diagnostic. I think that there's the, the whole then, the whole aspect of configuration management. You know, you have our NCM product right now that kind of is very CLI based, you know, kind of typical um, kind of tool from, you know, five, six years ago or even a bit longer. Um, I think that the interesting thing for us is, okay, you've got, you know, OVFSDB, you've got, you know, OF config, uh, you've got kind of all of those um, kind of additional protocol for config management, for instance, is, you know, when is the inflection point where we actually need to have that? Well, OVSDB, I guess, uh, may be a bit earlier now that with NSX, you know, it looks like that's, that's kind of what, you know, they're going to be using. But I think that, um, you know, from, from, from our perspective, um, we've also kind of the, the network config management that we've done has always been also um, not necessarily tied to the performance data that we are getting. Um, and so I think that for us, the question also is, is it time for us to start looking at, you know, taking the data that we are collecting from the network from a performance perspective, and then start basically looking at tailoring the rules that you're pushing back down to those devices to actually basically optimize the flow, basically just like what the, the, the dream of open flow SDN type of thing is. Uh, is Am I this. hearing another SDN controller floating around here? <laughs> Well, I think it's the question. You know, I don't think that we are at this point yet, but I think that as you see more and more of those things coming up, I think that you have to ask the question, you know, is that something that, you know, people are expecting from us and... and, and we don't need another platform. You can yeah. build an application that plugs in. No, we, we're not a platform yeah. company. Yep. Well, do you, do you expect... Uh, so, right, VMware is sort of uh, out of the gate faster, but they're not... I mean, Cisco's not going to sit quietly. Do you anticipate that you'll end up with networks that have multiple virtualized platforms? Oh, God forbid, but yes. No. <laughs> I disagree with them. It'll be, the market will either go VMware and that NSX strategy will pave over the network and that will be the product that you own and that is your network. And NSX will grow to become Campus and WAN. Mm as will Cisco, so Cisco's orchestration platform will grow from the data center to manage WANs, campus networks, and overlays will be everywhere. There will be nowhere that is not an overlay of the current architecture. But wouldn't it be a battle of attrition? They've all got well, competing, they, and it'd be like, we don't know who. No. I don't think and anyone. And if you look at, say, companies like Contrail and Nuage Networks, 
they're attacking the mega providers or the mega service provider market with m much deeper capabilities in terms of uh, managed service, what you call managed service providers, or I call multi-tenancy mm -hmm. at, at mega scale. And then you've got a range of other really interesting smaller ones, but which have point solutions where it might be possible to go hybridized, but I don't know how the orchestration, in, you know, the software integration at the upper levels doesn't really, in the next five years, is not, there's no, no federation, there's no interoperability for the foreseeable future. But you, you, may, you may have a data center or a pod with, on NSX, another data center, another site, potentially different platform, in terms of maybe it's nuage, yeah. and still yeah, platform back to federate both of those from a view perspective would still be We, we don't valuable. need to go through the Linux kernel wars again though, right? No. We went through a decade of 200, 300 Linux. If the messaging is standardized, if, if, like if it, but is there, how do you, the question is, how do you avoid it? I think, well, I mean, I think you've already seen, yeah, I mean, you, you can't. see projects you can't. Like daylight. No. I think there's going to be an NSX, there's going to be Common APIs, like right, yeah. Mm. So do you see anything coming on, on the open stack side that well, basically will be more open, or based on the open vSwitch, but not the Nisira stuff, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that thing is open. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, everybody's <laughs> using the open vSwitch kernel module, but then yeah. developing their own code on top of that, mm -hmm. right? So Nuage, Contrail, NSX, they're all doing that, and there's no interoperability, and nor are they planning it for the time being. It's too early in the development cycle. Interoperability is not a requirement. Well, and in fact, from the vendor's point of view, it's a negative, right? Yeah. They're hoping to be so dominant that they set the standard. I don't Which think is kind of so. funny because you look at SDN is all the promise of you know, yeah. multi-vendors, you know, openness, and now you end up with no, you know, NSX, which is a cruise The interoperability system. is It's simple. like cloud, and yet you have OpenStack and Amazon that are totally incompatible, so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think that that's, the, that's true. I, I disagree completely with your statement. I think you're completely on the wrong track. I think that they're all committed to interoperability, but in, there are no standards here. There's no, you know, BGP didn't leap out of the ground fully formed. It took 20 years to arrive, right? As a, as a dumb, <laughs> stupid way of interoperating networks, right? And it took a long time for people to get even that simplicity working reliably. So you're asking people to bring new products to market that are incredibly complex, and then you're saying, but you've got to get together and work on interoperability standards. The ITF isn't, mm -hmm. isn't able to handle this. They've been working on NVO3 for three years and they finally produced a rough draft of a really rubbish that nobody likes. I find um, even within a company, it's very hard to <coughs> get a standard agreed to go between companies who are competitors. Yeah. It's just crazy hard. So the, and there's no previous standards we can use to create east-west federation between mm -hmm. controllers, right? Because, I mean, so, look, even from the cloud perspective, you know, the, the, um, was it the DMTF put the cloud management, you know, and, and, and cloud interoperation standard? Yeah. What came out of that? Okay, there's a spec. Who is applying it? Yeah, but none of those, most of those standards bodies are completely outclassed by the current market. It's, it's moving faster than they're capable of. The people involved in the standards mm -hmm. body are often older and tired and weary. And they're, all, you know, <laughs> God knows I am. Uh, so, you know, and the organizations themselves are dying because the young, the, there's no young blood coming into those organizations. But if, if we want to know where the standards are coming from, it's people like Brent who are working in the Open Daylight Project, which will tend to write rough code that'll build a consensus that will push us forward into that. So that's where the standards will come from. And it, if I could suggest that you should engage there to, 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 to track the trend because you'll be at the intersection of all the vendors. So Cisco's there trying to take it in its direction. IBM's there trying to take it in its direction. Juniper and you know, NEC and HP are contributing code to that project. You should be able to see the, f the standards go through the prototyping phase and then understand the politics and interplay that's going on between the vendors. So Engaging yeah. with the IDL would be my suggestion. But and, and through there, you can help set the trend, right? Not just sort of be conservative, get the demand. You can help set the direction for the next. Conservative. Well, that's well, a lot. I mean, it's one thing to watch sausage being made; it's another thing to make sausage. Right? So, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that we have the. <laughs> the third to be being the sausage. Be <laughs> yeah, look, well, I, I think it's <laughs> an interesting <laughs> suggestion. Be the spaghetti wall. <laughs> Getting I mean, really, us to push to push those, uh, you know, those companies are a lot bigger than us and. Uh, you know, the management guys don't tend to direct things. I will say we had at least one experience where they try to ignore standards and, and do things, and then what really gets them is the customers. Well, but these and, aren't, I mean, so and Greg nailed it, right? Rough, working code, rough consensus. That's what you need. Because, right. I mean, so look, I mean, what is, what is the data plane of SDN right now? It's open vSwitch. That is the reference mm -hmm. model. 
not drafts. It has nothing to do with any standards bodies. It's an open source project where developers can go look at structs and say, here's how I'm going to implement the data plane in my switch. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think that's the only, you know, the con I think the control is just the next one to drop. I mean, that, I wouldn't be surprised to see it, ESX go open source. I mean, that's how disruptive it is. Yeah, but it's kind of interesting because you see a lot of momentum typically in those kind of, you know, okay, let's get the data plane working. And we've got this beautiful open V switch. And then it's always <laughs> an afterthought about how do we manage this thing? I mean, look how long it took to actually get OF config to actually come out. Or, you know, I mean, it just, it's always the same story. You always end up with, okay, I've got a great piece of technology in here. It's awesome. Mm. It can move packets like no other onto a software platform. Perfect. Mm. How do I manage this thing now? Yeah. That's boring. Uh, well, you know, it's, oh, how, you how does it plug it. within to my, my existing management infrastructure? Well, it doesn't. You've got this beautiful you know, CLI tool here you can use. And it, so it's always the same recipe, always. Yeah. And so I think that's what's difficult for us is, okay, yeah, we can go on those standard bodies and then you're sitting next to Cisco and Juniper and whatever. And, you know, in the end, you know how the battle is going to end up pretty much before starting. You know, I'm sure that, you know, some of those open source projects are different because it's not a standard body and it's more open. Uh, but, you know, look, we are a member of the DMTF and, you know, I, I've been sitting on some of those meetings and it's like, you know, it's just, I, I mean, I don't want to sit there, you know, and same thing with, honestly, with the IETF. You know, yeah. th that whole process is great, collaborative, and all so on. But, I mean, you need a team of people who are just doing that day in, day out. And for us, it's just not feasible, you know, kind of financially. I'm just saying, you know, get involved with the idea you'll be close enough to the fire to see what fuel's been thrown in yeah. and track what's going on. But, you know, as you say, don't necessarily get involved in... Yeah. That's, where, that's where the future of SDN, in my view, is, is mm -hmm. being formed. Because even VMware has to kowtow to ODL up to a point because that's going to define the east, west, and the north, south controller APIs. And that these people are going to go and do it, but they're all basically using the same um, cookie dough, if, even if they're cutting it into different shapes. No matter how hard they try, they all come back to OVS in the data plane, and they're putting their own extensions on the top. Now what they're all trying to do is say, well, we need the customers, you know, customers, carriers, service providers, enterprises are saying, I need interoperability before I'll take this. And if you want to know where that's going to come from, that's going to almost certainly come from the ODL today unless something changes yep. or at least you'll see it coming yeah <laughs> you know yeah yeah you'll see the logs being thrown into the fire before it <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah